I, I wrote down uh, the setting which I, with which I stopped last time. So G was, at least for the moment, an arbitrary, say, locally compact group, uh, K a compact subgroup, gamma a discrete subgroup, and X uh, a space on which G acts uh, transitively uh, with a fixed, and, and K is just a fixed group. Uh, and by using a representation of this compact subgroup, uh, we could go to a space of functions on X if we can associate to rho some automorphic factor. Uh, the automorphic factor. It, na, G. It's, now it's G. Uh, it can still be G uh, uh, quite arbitrarily. OK, and then can we can sp uh, explain the space of functions on x with values of v, which uh, have this um, automorphic invariance property, if you wish. Huh? This slash, it, this action here. OK, and then I mentioned that starting from any delta in g, if we act, if we act just by delta here, we get something that it has invariance property under a conjugate group. But to come back to the original group, we have to force it to become invariant under the correct group by this summation and um, by this condition on the f finiteness here. This is actually a finite sum, so this is purely algebraic, what I wrote down. Yeah? It's a finite sum, no convergence properties, and so on. So, um, OK, and uh, we can, and, and maybe I did this last time. Well, this summation here over the delta times gamma can be rephrased like this. If you take the double coset, gamma delta gamma, and you decompose it uh, into left cosets, then this will be something like this. Gamma prime, gamma prime is in, uh, uh, again, in this is the reason why we can do this. Dissected gamma. And so we can also write it like the union, this double co coset, we, we just decompose in a finite union of some gammas. Uh, this is finite. No? And these gammas are just the delta times gamma prime. This is just some, some exercise in elementary algebra. So by taking this average here, gamma, uh, we end up with something that comes originally from, or can be described by double cosets. So this T of delta is actually a T of gamma delta gamma. Huh? It only depends on this double coset. Now, I said, or I wrote that this defines an endomorphism of this space of kind of modular forms. But endomorphisms can be uh, composed. Huh? And now I give a description, abstract description of this composition of these endomorphisms. No? Uh, so <coughs> endomorphisms algebraically. Uh, and possibly we construct infinitely many endomorphisms of a space which is just zero. <laughs> yeah, that is, we do not know how big this space is, but we abstractly construct uh, such an algebra um, which consists of all these uh, endomorphisms, or doesn't consist of them, but these endomorphisms are images of, of what we do. So now to this setting here, we add something namely a, a semi g uh, 
such that for all s in s, well, this finite. Or maybe to write down the property directly that gamma as gamma is a These double cosets are finite unions of left cosets, and all the left cosets can be described by elements from this semi subgroup Si and S. Okay. Um, okay. And now um, let me introduce. The Hecker algebra as a set, it will be uh, the set of formal linear combinations, say over C, but we could also take some suffering uh, of gamma, S gamma, S and S. This is a C vector space, and similarly, we take the left cosets okay, and um, H comma S can be viewed as a subset of these. By identifying uh, gamma s gamma so this is this this thing un union will be identified with this formal sum no? so and clearly, uh, I should say, since um, um, all these double cosets in this here, uh, maybe I should write it here, uh, all the double cosets here, they act on this space of functions, so this can be extended linearly to the space of functions. So this acts on f x v. Gamma. Not only the individual double cosets, but also their sums. And now I want to define some multiplication uh, uh, in this framework, which finally describes the composition here. How can I do this? Uh, I start here. Yeah. Now you can, <laughs> I hope you see that I cannot do this. This is not well defined. You know, by taking representatives from the left cosets and multiplying them and taking the left coset again, this is no longer uh, independent of representatives. Things become much better, however, if I take a double coset here and take the gamma as i times t. Then this is independent of choosing the representatives, and I get a product going from H gamma S cross L gamma S to L gamma S. But it's not possible to, to, to define this product here uh, just for the left cosets, uh, uh, because it's not well defined. And 
it's now an easy observation that <laughs> if the second factor is also a double coset or a sum of double cosets, then the result is a sum of double cosets. So you can define it on these things, but uh, if you take both of them in the double cosets, you end up well with left cosets, which can be um, put together into double cosets. So this is all kind of abstract algebraic nonsense. Yeah? Okay. So becomes so she algebra and uh, in some cases you know or you should know this algebra if S is not a semi-group, but a group, and uh, gamma is a normal subgroup in S, then H gamma S is just a group algebra. But that is a case which, in our context, almost never happens. Yeah? Uh, is group algebra for uh, is not gamma. Huh? OK, so sometimes this is a generalization of a group algebra. OK. Now, um, Now we can apply the hack operator as one. We can apply again the hack operator as two. But when you look at these definitions, yeah, we end up with the sums of left cosets, and which left cosets will appear? It's just the ones we needed to describe the product of the hack operators abstractly. So this is the same as f slash gamma s1 gamma gamma s2 gamma. Huh? So this is an abstract version of this composition of the two operators. Yeah? This is what we wanted. OK, so this is. I will finish with this abstract nonsense. Now, let me describe this explicitly for GLN and for SPN. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have to choose our gamma and our S according to what we think will be interesting for us. Uh, all I needed here. So oh, I think I need it. 
Our G is itself is, is not, not so important. What is important is G and Z, and S will be uh, G and Q. And uh, occasionally, I might take just invertible um, integral matrices. Anyone, the, 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 the white one as well as S upper Z uh, have these properties which are requested concerning the finiteness of the index. Yeah? So I can use these. And Yeah, maybe I think as Z, but it doesn't matter really. The point is that now, using linear algebra for uh, matrices over Z, by the elementary divisor theorem, I can write down representatives of the double cosets. Huh? And in fact, they are unique. This is not really a serious restriction here, because uh, by scalar multiplication, I can go <coughs> uh, to the rational case. Um, OK. And immediately, I get that by this, that for this case here, this Hecke algebra uh, is commutative. Uh, we use just the trans uh, use uh, transpose. Uh, uh, Taking the transpose of everything, you, you, you can see that you don't get an endomorphism of a Hecker algebra, but an anti-endomorphism. But by using these double cosets, they are stable under the, um, under the transpose. And that's the reason why it's a commutative algebra. So that's already nice. But something else happens, this age. Gamma S can be decomposed um, in the following way. It's a tensor product of H uh, gamma uh, GL and Z 1 over P, where I allow all primes and I take a restricted tensor product, meaning that only finitely components are not the identity. So here I just allow um, um, denominators in P. Yeah? Or if you wish, if you take integral matrices as S, the determinant is the power of P. And how do I get this? Use uh, gamma S gamma. If S T R and S Z and determinant of S and determinant of T are co prime. I mean this is neither this nor this are uh, full proofs, but they indicate what you have to do. Huh? So things with co prime determinant have this simple decomposition in the Hecker algebra. Yeah. And this gives you a possibility now just to stick to the case where you take uh, allow powers of p here in the denominator or as, de uh, as determinants. And it's this algebra which one can write down explicitly. 
Okay. Okay. Ah, maybe there is someone in the room who knows a completely different definition of Hecke algebras, namely as functions on a periodic group, and functions, uh, locally constant functions on a periodic group, compact support, and the algebra multiplication is convolution with respect to the uh, Haar measure. Maybe there is someone here who knows this definition. If you know this definition, you can do some exercise to see that it's completely the same. Because uh, by these you take just invariant functions, invariant from the left and from the right, and then you um, they are since they are locally constant, <laughs> they will be constant on double cosets. And the values of the functions, they just enter into the coefficients of these double cosets. Yeah? And then when you do this integration with some calculation, you can see that it's just the same as uh, what I wrote down here. Yeah? And anyway, this consideration works over all principal ideal domains. Uh, OK. So, it may appear that in, in some works uh, you have seen this more sophi sophisticated definition. OK, so now I want to explain uh, the algebraic structure of this. And uh, this works by identifying this with a certain space uh, of uh, rational functions invariant under some finite group. Uh, okay. So the aim is now to describe the algebraic structure of this. Yeah. Uh, x1 to xn are some variables. And how do we do this? Mm. Now, by the action of GLN z from the left, we can make our g, change our g into upper triangular matrix. Yeah? So, furthermore, uh, at least if it's integral, we will have uh, just uh, we, anyway. We will have powers of p then on the diagonal, just powers of p, positive or negative powers of p. So it is p k one up to p k n zero and something. Well, and you can imagine um, you can change these things from the left by modulo p to the k to the n, and the, hi the higher this power is, the more left representatives you will have. Yeah? So uh, this is just the motivation for what is going on here, uh, but you have to accept. Where I can define whatever I want, I take xi divided by p to the i. So I put higher weights here on the things uh, which are lower in the, on the diagonal because there are more things to be taken in, more left cosets to be taken into consideration. And then Hmm. I can do this, certainly. 
And now one can comp <laughs> compute some images of double cosets. Uh, can take Q of some double coset by interpreting this as a finite sum of the left cosets, and then I use this. And, and, but these I can compute. Is it plus or minus? It's plus. Uh, times EI, and EI is the I elementary it's uh, something very simple uh, e1 is just x1 plus x2 plus and so and so on and en is then uh, uh, the product of x1 up to e xn so this is And uh, okay. Hmm. So, um, at least from these double cosets, we do not end up here, but we end up in the space of symmetric, uh, 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 space of invariant rational functions under Sn. Ah, because all of these are invariant. Um, and luckily, these things generate the Hecker algebra. So. So, so up to the inductivity of this map Q, we have now what is called the Satake isomorphism. Now, at the end, we will be interested in eigenfunctions of all these operators. Now, attaching to the elements of the Hecke algebra, these eigenvalues give you a character of the algebra. Huh? Now, 
uh, you are tempted to think, okay, um, uh, this means we attach some numbers to the xi. But <laughs> you see, these are invariant polynomials, and so we cannot just take numbers. Uh, we must take into account this invariance. So instead of n numbers which we can attach to x1 to xn, we get n numbers which are not unique. Yeah, but they are unique up to something. So any homomorphism uh, H Z and So, uh, okay. And these numbers, which are not uniquely determined, they are d unique up to Sn. They are called the Satake parameters. Yeah? So uh, now I shortly tell you what's happening for SPN, because after all you should remember uh, why do I do both things simultaneously. It's a little bit making life easier for us, because uh, most of these calculations are easier for GLN. But we will only apply it in the case of SPN, because the uh, holomorphic Siegel modular forms, they have much more number theory than the automorphic forms on GLN. Yeah? So I use the GLN only as a appetizer yeah, here. And uh, just tell you the re analogous result for SPN, which will then be the one which we really use. Concerning SPN, anyway, I make the life a little bit easier for all of us because I use the group SPN and not the group of similitudes introduced by Alexei. <coughs> yeah? I do not use GSPN, but I use SPN. This is, has several reasons. Yeah? Why I, huh? uh, no. Lally H S P Z something called a yeah. W N is again a group uh, a finite group generated by Sn and generated by Xi goes to Xi as different from J. So this group is bigger. 
but it's still a finite group. No? It's a vile group anyway, but this, this is proved in the same way, but it's more painful. And again, there are characters These are Sataki parameters, similarly to them over there, but they are not uniquely determined, only up to these uh, maps, um, either interchanging them or pu putting one alpha j into alpha j inverse. No? Okay. Okay, now um, hmm. how can we switch to the definition of L functions now? So we have these and numbers which are not uniquely defined. Uh, and how can we go to a definition of um, L Euler factors? No? Now we do the following. We take this alpha 1 to alpha n, which are not unique, but are unique up to some action. And we view them as describing some semi-simple conjugacy class in some algebraic group, no? in the L group. So, Now, this is complex group. <laughs> and so they do not describe uh, in this way alpha 1 to alpha n are not unique. But they are unique up to these changes of position. Yeah. So. We look at this group uh, for this split quadratic form. No? And we look at these elements as giving semi simple conjugacy classes in SO2n plus 1c. And now we can give the definition of uh, uh, L factor depending on these Satake parameters. Uh, 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 what is that? 
Ah, so. Now, um, you should remember in my first talk, I started with saying how do polynomial representations enter into this field. And one reason was that we use them to define Euler factors. And I said, I will postpone this uh, up to now. Now I do this. We, this has nothing to do with our row, which was also a representation of GLN. Yeah? The auto coming uh, related to the automorphic factor. This is uh, just a polynomial representation of GLN C to some completely different GLT C. And maybe you should write P here. And now I apply this to this. What do you mean by a polynomial? Not rational, uh, really. Uh, uh, polynomial. Uh, it is given by polynomial functions. Yeah? It's not determinant to the inverse, for instance. Yeah? So maybe to the minus s. Minus one. So there will be, I explained this last time, there will be infinitely many such representations, even infinitely many such irreducible representations, uh, which you can parameterize by the highest weight. So the, this, in principle, defines infinitely many Euler, pro Euler factors, which for function, then you can glue into a, fun a, a function. This is only the local one. Uh, here we take SO to n plus 1 C going to a GL C polynomial. Oh, not one R, this is one T. No? And again, we have infinitely many of them depending on these, on the cho our choice of these polynomial representations. Okay. Global L, this was for all P here, a global L function
So if I have an eigenform of all these operators, then the eigenvalues give me uh, some algebra homomorphism to C. These algebra homomorphisms um, I can describe by these Hatake parameters, and then ultimately I can take a, um, a, a product of all these LPs. No? So L F S R uh, S is now not in the semi group, but S is now ah, maybe here also some R should be. These alpha i, these attack parameters, they describe We should be aware that I am cheating at several points. I always use the full group gamma being GLNZ or SPNZ. What you have to do if your modular forms uh, sit on a smaller group gamma of finite index, then somehow you have to move away the bad factors because there, uh, in this context, we cannot say anything about the Hecke algebra and we cannot guarantee that we can get eigenforms. So this is uh, a level one description. Huh? Um, otherwise, you sh would have to be careful and uh, avoid some of the primes. So, now, this is a beautiful definition, <laughs> but I must tell you that it's very disappointing what we really know. Huh? Imagine we have now for automorphic forms on GLN or SPN, we have a definition of infinitely many uh, Euler products. <laughs> but in general, we just know more or less uh, the analytic properties of one of these L functions. Except for, say, for GL2, uh, in small groups, something more is known. But if n is arbitrary, we do not know very much. In fact, we do know we know nothing, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, let me shortly give examples where we know something. Or at least mention them. Now, uh, I had this described the irreducible polynomial representations of GLNC by the highest weights. And for GL2, we just have two, two weights. Huh? And the second of them just gives you the power of the determinant which you have. Huh? So more or less, you just have one number. Uh, so I call this uh, new plus one C. This is a new symmetric power. This is a
Well, if I would allow here something, this would just give me a shift in my arguments. So it is nothing to be <laughs> really of importance. Uh, it would just take your p to the minus s to p to the minus s plus something. So that does not matter. And um, what does it give you here? So. Ah. Of course, it gives you now. Oh, I have two Sataka parameters. Uh, uh, the sum of them is just the piece free coefficient of uh, your modular form if it's uh, normalized. And the product is p to the weight uh, of the modular form minus 1. Um, so maybe minus 1. Now, last time I, I gave you an explicit description of these uh, symmetric powers in terms of actions on uh, polynom homogeneous polynomials of a certain degree, yeah, of degree nu. And so they act very simply. Uh, alpha, so such diagonal matrices act very simply on them. And what I get is alpha 1 a. Uh, Alpha to b p to the minus s a plus b is new. Ah. So this is a new uh, tensor uh, L function. And for new is equal to 1, this is the usual one. Of Hecke, yeah, Euler product of degree two. This is symmetric square. And uh, in this situation, it is not so bad. We know something up to what is the world record? I don't know, seven, eight, or nine. Alexei, do you know what is the highest power where we know something? Maybe seven or eight. Seven, yeah. Okay, but this this is the o for GL two. This is the only type of L functions which you can define, yeah, by this recipe. But nevertheless, it's as many as new, which means um, it's infinitely many of them. Uh, so. Meromorphic continuation but not more. So okay. Mm -hmm. And for a symplectic case, the situation is much worse. We just know something about one L function in general. And uh, for this L function, the representation is the most stupid one which you can imagine. You just take the identity. Yeah. <laughs> so R will be GL Ah, not GL, SO uh, Here I can
So if you have f, uh, which now I use the notation of last time, this was a Siegel modular form. Uh, this is a space of Siegel modular forms for SPN z with automorphic factor rho. If it's an eigenform of all the cooperators, then we can introduce what is called F standard S. Standard because this R is a standard representation of SO2 n plus 1. Now, <laughs> what does it give you? Uh, just 1 minus p to the minus s, product i equals 1 to n, 1 minus alpha i p to the minus s, 1 minus alpha i inverse p to the minus s. And I should write here p, always p. So the alpha i p are the Sataki parameters. For f, and this will appear, I guess, also in, in Alexei's uh, talks again, and again in my own uh, last talk, it will definitely appear again. About this function, we know a lot of things. But it's the only one. It doesn't make any sense to give you <laughs> more definitions for other representations. Yeah? Because for the others, we do not know anything. For SPN with N general. For SP Pardon? For the Yeah, I just say for SP2 and for SP3, but I talk about SPN. Yeah? I do not talk about particularly small groups where you have some exceptional isomorphisms and so on. I just talk about SPN, and for SPN, it, it's just this one. For other L functions, we just know to write down some definition, but nothing more. Terrible. Yeah. Well, we know that this converges in some half plane, but that is. Uh, this well-known will be explained uh, by two methods, by Alexei and by myself. I guess you, you explained the Rankin-Selberg method here. Alexei, do you explain the, yeah? Okay, yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Now this is the de definition of these L functions. I had mentioned before what the raison d'être of all this is, that we have a lot of algebraic structure on our spaces of modular forms. And one of the parts of uh, this algebraic uh, structure is the structure of Hecke algebras and uh, um, these L factors. So even, and I want to <laughs> emphasize this again, so even if these spaces of modular forms may be of very small dimension, we still have many, many endomorphisms given by our um, uh, Hecker operators. So, okay. Now, Now, maybe I write down mn rho again. Uh, hn to v, which is for all gamma in spnz. Uh, 
F rho gamma is F, and F is holomorphic. So um, I have to add two things. If n is equal to 1, some additional property is needed. For higher degree, that means for n bigger than 1, we get it for free by the so-called Kircher principle. So we can ignore this. And the other thing is, in most cases, uh, we can substitute this by by that index, which again for n is bigger than one, is the same as a congruence subgroup. Yeah. For SL2, there are problems with congruence properties. Not, not all not subgroups of finite index will be congruence subgroups, but for higher n, it is the same. Huh? Subgroup of finite index or congruence subgroup. Uh, and sometimes I will mention what's happening for the congruence subgroups. So. Um, <laughs> And this is the space I really want to talk about. Uh, uh, let me just solve this. Ah, uh, maybe, yeah. This Kn describes how, in which, uh, to which power the determinant appears in this row. So in the scalar value case, and also for SL2, it just means if the weight is negative. Yeah? The determinant part uh, appears with a negative power, then this space is just 0. So this is analogous to what you know for modular forms for SL2z. If the weight is negative, you don't have modular forms. Uh, yeah. The crucial thing is we have Fourier expansion. Up, up, <laughs> crucial uh, is also the existence of Hecker operators, but the other thing is Fourier expansion. This appeared shortly in. Alexei's uh, lecture. Um, so um, the reason is that one and zero and one and S is an SPNZ. And therefore, we have a, well, we should not call it Fourier expansion because it is not a Fourier expansion in the sense of real analysis. It's, um, it's a Laurent expansion for the variable e to the 2 pi i z. Uh, but people call it Fourier expansion, but this is an abuse of. Language. I like to mention this whenever I give a talk in uh, the Institut Fourier that it's not the Fourier expansion, but Laurent expansion. So, but what does it look like? Now, in this exponent, all integral linear combinations of the independent variables should appear. Now, that is a symmetric matrix. Yeah? And if I take the trace of t times z, where t itself is symmetric, 
then and for and t is integral and symmetric then the variables outside of the diagonal appear twice yeah again simple thing about trace of the product of uh, two matrices and therefore t will be in something we call lambda n which is all symmetric matrices which are half integral and the diagonal matrices diagonal entries are um, uh, integral we call this half integral matrices but just just a way to describe the integral linear combinations of the independent variables and it is positive semi-definite we get this for free now I should call this AF of T and this AF of T is not a number but it is uh, something in our representation space so this is, an, this is not so particular but what comes now is absolutely crucial for all the arithmetic here's the theorem first of all there exist such modular forms with rational Fourier coefficients from the definition it's not clear at all and we, you, can general, you can generate all modular forms from them even more um, this true um, did I uh, I just thought. Let me write a prime here and explain it in a moment. Tensor C. can multiply them by some uh, uh, joint denominator to get integral things so the Fourier coefficients uh, you can choose a basis of the space of modular forms such that um, mm, uh, all the elements of this basis have rational Fourier coefficients with bounded denominators or you can write the way you can choose them uh, to be integral if you want um, so the way I wrote it down is not true like this I have to uh, explain what this means so rho after choosing Rho for GL. This is an automorphic factor, but it goes to GL MC and then now <laughs> again this will not be completely true because you could change your basis in C to the in C to the M by a by a matrix with transcendental entries then it does not work yeah? so this statement makes only sense if this row is itself defined over Q but this you can do defined over Q means it's a polynomial representation and the polynomial entries describing the po uh, this uh, representations they have rational coefficients 
otherwise it makes no sense yeah you could change your basis by multiplying a basis element by pi and then things do no longer work uh, so that rho this is possible and you have to do this to get such a statement yeah? so we have chosen a coordinate system in this way the Fourier coefficient sit in C to the M and we request all the entries to be rational yeah? with pos with just with bounded denominators but this is possible to choose and, and, and of course necessary now I have to say that for this statement in this generality, you don't, you cannot find it in the literature. Uh, for special cases, it's known like uh, if rho is just the determinant power of determinant, uh, then you can find it in work of Shimura or other people. But uh, I maybe in my last talk, I will even give you a kind of proof of this. Yeah, uh, using the uh, doubling method. Uh, yes. So where am I now? Five, six. Huh? Okay. Ah. The other thing is. So. I have to emphasize this here because again this is different from what you might know from SL2. In the case of SL2, uh, knowing eigenvalues means you know the free expansion. Huh? But uh, here, when uh, you will soon see from the formulas which I write down, that hacker operators will connect only a few of the free coefficients. It's like for modular forms of half integral weight, where the Hecker operators only connect the Fourier coefficients for which the indices sit in the same square class. Yeah? But it's even worse here in some sense. So um, Here you can choose left cosets in this way, and you have to do this because then, when you take these representatives, then you can act on the Fourier expansion. No. So, and you have T of G is then just the sum of these i rho of di inverse uh, f of a i z plus b i d i inverse and this has a free expansion now because it's after all it's a modular form let's say b of s e to the 2 pi i trace of s z s again in this lambda and and um, now bi together with the di inverse gives some exponential sums with some uh, cancellations now and then you have ai z di inverse times uh, the Fourier the the matrix T describing your Fourier coefficient when you plug this in to your 
uh, free expansion of f so it means the b of s will be a sum um, ah, I just write a linear combination of the a f of t with uh, d i inverse t huh? ah yes this way and this the uh, coefficients of this linear combination will depend on these exponential sums which occur here in particular it only connects uh, Fourier coefficients b of s and uh, a of t where s and t are rationally equivalent yeah. This is a rational equivalence relation for between S and T. Um, okay, ah, yeah, I could have written AI inverse here anyway because uh, uh, this formula works for similitudes as well. And that was the reason why I wrote it this way. DI is AI inverse. So, okay, uh, inverse transposed. Yeah. Okay, so this means the hack operators connect only very few of the free coefficients because there will be infinitely many rational equivalence classes which ha com uh, stay completely disjoint under hacker operators. Uh, so the situation is very much different from elliptic modular forms and similar to half integral weight case. Uh, okay. But nevertheless, this has important uh, implication. Uh, huh? Three thirty, right? Until three thirty. Uh -huh. uh. Look at this simple action. This um, uh, hack operators preserve M and rho of Q, and this in turn implies that the Hecke, the Hecke eigenvalues which can appear will be algebraic numbers. Finite dimensionality also gives you that it's in a finite Q. If you insist on algebraic integers uh, to come out here as Hecke eigenvalues, 
this is a problem of the normalization of Hecker operators. Huh? I mean, this can be done. You can normalize them in such a way so that the um, eigenvalues will be algebraic numbers, e even algebraic integers. If Okay. Ah, uh, yes. So, good. Another corollary, actually, of the director of the theorem. Is that consider any field automorphism of C over Q in any F? Uh, And F sigma, where you apply ah, now you can apply the sigma to these elements of C to the M, um, component-wise. Huh? A priori, it's not clear what you do when you apply such an automorphism of C here, because you could could create a crazy collection of uh, coefficients here by applying your sigma. Uh, but uh, since you could start from here, you can transfer the action. Here you have a trivial action of, of sigma, and you will get um, that you can apply automorphism of C to modular forms and get new modular forms. Uh, I should say this works whenever the theorem is applicable. That is, after you have chosen the coordinates for rho appropriately. Yeah? It, this is only a problem in the vector valued case. Yeah? Uh, if, uh, yeah. In the situation of the theorem, you must uh, choose the coordinates, otherwise, we cannot apply uh, sigma. Uh, and we should choose them in such a way that we can apply this theorem, and then we can act by automorphisms of C on our uh, modular forms and get new modular forms. OK, so maybe I have one minute left, but I, I present this <laughs> uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, next time I, I take this two minutes in addition. Yeah? I will then start with giving some examples, including Theta series, including Eisenstein series, including Klingen Eisenstein series, and there we will already see that free expansions of such modular forms will involve values of zeta functions. So, thank you. I have two questions, actually. Uh, first one, if you consider a uh, single modular form, but invariant by some congruence, yes. Uh, then do you still have this theorem on uh, uh, To be safe, um, 
you might have to substitute uh, rational numbers by a cyclotomic field. Huh? Then it's definitely sure that you can do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but for safety, you should do this. For instance, when you have neben typo, something like gamma zero group with a neben typos character, then you definitely have to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah? So going to congruent subgroup, everything works the same way. By sub uh, when you substitute z by the ring of integers in the cyclotomic number field, where the level of the nth or m's uh, cyclotomic number field comes from the congruence mod m. Uh, if it's a congruence subgroup of level m, you should, for safety, mm -hmm. yeah, just for safety. The other thing is, uh, when you go to congruence subgroups, you also have Fourier expansions in all other cusps. Yeah, and they're also automatically um, uh, cyclotomic. Uh, um, the you may have a free expansion at an infinity, um, which is rational, but if you go to another cusp, suddenly a cyclotomic field appears. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the second question, when uh, you define the local L factors, uh, then this depends on uh, representation. Yes. And but I'm wondering because we saw two specific representations really. In general, are these rep do we know how these representations look like? Are they classified like we know? Yeah, this is what I did uh, last time. It's polynomial representations. You can write it down in terms of the the highest weights. As classified, they are. And you, c the problem is, perhaps uh, to write down explicit models for them. Yeah, wouldn't I mean you can this. Wouldn't that be Galois representations? No, it's not Galois representations. This is polynomial representations of GLNC. Maybe in hundred years they may, <laughs> 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 but at the moment, uh, and abstractly defined because you have to be aware. As long as I define them in this more general way, I. Um, I include in the in the definition there was nothing about holomorphy, so uh, I would include all kind of general general types of mass waveforms, and they have nothing to do with number theory. Yeah. No. Most of them, unless you specify something. Yeah. So. In the context in which I define them, as long as I did not go to Ziegel, holomorphic Ziegel modular forms, these things have nothing to do with number theory. It's just analysis. No? You have some strange functions which have uh, some invariance property. And uh, as you can see from the mass waveforms, unless you specify some eigenvalues of the Laplace operator, uh, most of them don't carry any kind of number theory. Yeah? I mean, this is. But this is, yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Yeah.